Hi, my name is Sarah O'Rourke and I'll be doing our HR presentation with Tommy O'Connell and Peter Abernethy. So first of all, I'll be talking about globalisation and localisation. So first of all, globalisation, it's not a new concept, it's been around for thousands of years. Um, it's the scene when like, India was connecting to the UK when they were trading spices and then when um, China was connecting to Europe when they were trading silk. Uh, globalisation expedited and increased due to speed of travel, transfer of information via the internet, and uh, we're very influenced by America through like Facebook and other forms of social media. Um, the EEC was set up after World War II to connect um, the six founding countries um, to trade coal and steel. Uh, later then the four freedoms were uh, set up. This is the free movement of goods, persons, services and capital. Uh, globalisation is interaction and integration of people, companies and governments of different nations. It has been, it has an effect on the environment, culture, political systems, economic development and human, human physical well-being in societies around the world. Um, globalisation helps benefit poorer countries economically and raise their citizens and it raised their citizens' standards of living. However, it is argued that the creation of uh, globalisation or the creation of an international free market has benefited multinational corporations in the Western world at the expense of local enterprises, cultures, and the common people. Therefore, governments try to manage the flow of labour, capital, goods, and ideas, um, which can lead to conflict and extremist views and immigration and globalisation. Uh, Localisation then in recent years Peter, uh, in recent years there has been a dramatic shift from globalisation uh, to localisation. Why uh, you can blame, like some people could blame around the economic downturn, terrorist attacks and the introduction of protectionism laws. Um, so first of all the economic downturn um, it can lead to extremist views from nations as they tend to put the blame on in immigrants taking their jobs. Um, so there's like hostility, discrimination and racism evident in uh, London after they voted um, to Brexit uh, because the, cause London is so diverse because there's so many different nationalities there. Um, UKIP then is an extremist political party um, that encouraged the idea of Brexit. Um, other nations are taking the similar, um, for example, Rila Penn, if she gets uh, elected, she's taking Brexit because she wants to take control over money and how it's spent in their country. Um, and for example, she, she wants to get rid of the euro and bring in France again. Uh, this can be compared to Germany in the 1930s and how Hitler came into power. Uh, terrorism, terrorism then is another point of why some nations are going from globalised to localised. Um, terrorist attacks has led to governments increasing their security policy and more restrictions on granting visas. For example, in the US after 9-11, um, there was lots of discrimination and racism towards the Muslim community. And then last week, there was a terrorist attack, a terrorist attack outside the House of Parliament and can lead to further uh, move towards localised views. For example, there's like a live street um, live feeds from Sky News and some of the comments were like roll on Brexit, can't wait to Brexit so it could go from more of a 50-50 to more of like towards the Brexit. Thanks for listening, going to pass on to Tommy O'Connell. Hi, I'm Tommy O'Connell and I'm going to be taking you through how America seems to move from a globalisation to a localisation country. So here we have Donald J. Trump, he was voted the 45th President of the United States of America on the 8th of November uh, 2016. He launched his campaign in June 2015 against 17 other, other Republican candidates. And on July 2016, he was voted the head Republican candidate to go in the presidential election against the Democratic leader, Hillary Clinton. Donald J. Trump is currently the oldest and wealthiest president in United States history, and he's described by many as a nationalist. Now his major agenda through his whole campaign was this slogan, to make America great again. So his whole um, backstory about the, uh, through, through, through the election was trying to bring jobs back to America and trying to make America powerful again. He wanted to bring back all the factories that had moved away to other countries, bring back all the jobs. 
and that's what one of his ma major slogans was. So, Trump's America. Trump has Trump wooed and wowed the middle, white middle class American voters by shrewdly focusing on two major issues: number one, trade, and number two, immigration, that the American people were angered by the most. They want they hate the fact that all their factories and companies were going over to the likes of Russia and China or China and Mexico, where the companies were paying uh, they could pay the workforce a uh, lower wage, but they had to still produce the same quality and quantity of products. His main focus again was to bring all these factories back. So he so he told the American people, as a politician, whether he comes through it or not, who knows? Uh, Trump's victory proved uh, to, to to everyone that people who have nothing to lose um, will vote for something, anything, in order to um, in order in order in bid to improve their lives. Um, Trump Trump completely bashed. Trump completely bashed Mexico, uh, Mexico, China, and immigration, um, pledging to overhaul America's trade negotiation system with other countries, and he promised to deport 11 million uh, immigrants who were working in America, who he said, his quote, were taking American jobs. So, many economics warned that Trump's uh, get tough trade policies would cause both a trade war and a recession, which would batter all the voters, all the millions of voters who actually did vote for him. So said Michael Greenhouse of the Huffington Post, 2017. Deporting 11 million immigrants in America would cause would cause wreckage to the U.S. system. By it would devastate local communities and it would reduce um, consumer demand in the likes of the shop, shopping markets. Uh, appliance stores and car dealerships, and thus, um, and thus crippled the American economic growth. So, Trump's desire to close borders to international markets um, could negatively affect the ability of major tech companies and startups to attract overseas talent. Jeffrey Gordon uh, is a professor of business law at Columbia University, and he said it would mean less openness to relaxing visa restrictions on highly skilled foreign workers and thus you would have to pay more to the existing workforce and overall in industry dynamics would slow down. So tech companies in particular like to bring in specialised workers on a H1B visa which I'll talk about later on and um, which allows uh, immigrants to work in the United States of America. So Trump, Trump accused these tech companies of trying to go overseas and looking for cheap overseas labour, but the tech companies' response was that they were just looking for the hottest global talent. So these tech companies included uh, Google, Apple, and Microsoft. So according to a report by the National Foundation of American Policy, the United States has 87 startups that are worth over $1 billion, and over half of them have been started by uh, illegal immigrants. Uh, immigrants, or, sorry, not really. Uh, immigrants feature prominently in key management positions or product development teams in more than seventy percent of these startup operations. So that was a report by the National Foundation for Foreign Policy. So the H-1B visa gives immigrants the chance to go and work in America uh, legally um, on a short-term basis. Uh, it allows U.S. employees to temporarily employ foreign workers in specialty occupations and currently meets 85,000 immigrants each year. So it's a major visa in America that allows international workers to go and work in America um, legally. If a foreign worker in the H-1B that quits or is dismissed from his sponsoring uh, company, then they must enter or apply or for, they must enter and apply for a new grant for a different application status under immigration. So again, okay. So on March the 3rd, 2017, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service announced on their website that they were temporarily, um, they were temporarily suspending the, the premium process for all their H-1B visas. So they weren't getting rid of the H-1B visa, but they were slowing down the process. There was going to be no more fast track visas. So again, it, it was, it's going to make it harder. So this is only recently. So again, this is going to have a major effect for companies now who want to bring in international workers into America. 
So this is a quote from Donald Trump at the Miami University uh, in March 2016 in one of his many debates. So he said, I know the H1Bs are very well. We shouldn't have it. It's very, very bad for the American people. And it's unfair to workers and we should end it. But then, only March this year, as he was elected, his views changed. He said, he said in an interview, I'm changing it and I'm softening my position because we want the best talent working in this country. So, on St. Patrick's Day Eve, Trump was put in an awkward position when our own Taoiseach, Ian McKinney, uh, trolled him on stage by suddenly calling out his immigration policy in front of the whole world. Now in his statement, Ian McKinney said, we would like this to be sorted. It would remove a burden of so many people that they could stand out in the life and say, now I'm free to contribute to America as I know, and that's, <coughs> and that's what people want. Currently, um, there are over 50,000 uh, illegal Irish immigrants living in America. Thank you for listening to me today. I'm going to pass you on to Peter, who will talk to you about Brexit. Hi, I'm Peter Brennan, and I'm just going to take you through Brexit, Britain's exit from the European Union. So, um, basically, the referendum was held um, as part of Dave Cameron's election promises. He promised to hold. Um, uh, referendum on Britain leaving the EU, so he but he mainly thought that it was going to just silence aspects of his own party, and he didn't believe that it would actually succeed. And certain other members of um, the UK were ha also happy the referendum was held, and other uh, political groups. And um, but his own motivation was just to silence um, members of his own party. And um, it was held on the twenty third of June, twenty sixteen. Um, and it succeeded with a 51.9% majority. A uh, worldwide shock was felt in the stock exchange as a result, um, and Britain um, triggered Article uh, 50 on the 29th of March um, 2017. Um, John Curtis um, coined the term Euroscepticism. This basically was meaning that people were um, getting sick of Europe's control of the UK, um, and this, he coined this term at the time of Brexit. Um, for workers, uh, Brexit meant um, that uh, when Britain would leave the EU, um, the free transfer of workers within um, the country was going to be affected. So this was straight away going to in impact on international workers. Uh, reasons for leaving. Um, there were three main reasons. Um, sovereignty, um, so control of um, Britain's own money. Um, was 49% um, of uh, people's reasons. And um, immigration was 33%. Uh, so this was, um, people were um, noticing an influx of um, immigrants into the country. And, and a lot of people uh, weren't happy with it and they wished for the UK to take back its own borders. And the age of voters, um, basically 90% um, of over 65 year olds voted, whereas only 64% um, of 18 to 24 year olds voted. So as a result, you ended up with a much older voting um, demographic. Um, the older group, um, Matthew Goodwin and Rob Ford, coined the term um, the left behind, the older white conservative group. Um, basically, they, they had been left behind. The needs of others were met as what they would have felt themselves um, before them, and that they no longer had a stake in how, in saying how Britain was run. Um, so basically, the increase of migrants um, People weren't really happy about how they were coming into the country. No, this wasn't really international workers as such, and it was more the, even the migrant crisis in France had brought it to, and um, with the migration of people coming from France was the main reasons, and um, obviously they were coming from further afield and then crossing into England through France. Um, the immediate aftermath of the vote, and um, the sterling was at its weakest point um, in the stock exchange since 1985. This is key as international workers um, are going to be often paid in sterling, so it's not as appealing to come to a country where um, the currency is at a low value um, in proportion to your own currency, therefore you're going to be making less money. So for international workers this will be um, a major point. Um, David Cameron stepped down as Prime Minister and he, as he was supporting the um, state vote, he felt his position was untenable so he left. Um, American markets closed 3% following the day of the announcement. So basically, the US had a lot of invested interests. A lot of multinationals um, 
and other companies are invested in the UK or they may be American countries that are exporting into the UK um, they will be highly affected um, by any major change such as this in um, the UK so um, that's also going to affect their workers that are in that country as well and if the company's performance isn't going as well um, obviously their workers are going to suffer as well a major factor was um, the UK losing its AAA rating for credit, so it's now more expensive for the UK to borrow money. So anything linked with the UK's um, domestic market, they're now going to um, have a more expensive um, cost on uh, borrowing money. So every time that they take out a loan um, as a country, it's going to cost them more. Um, so leaving Europe and um, the world's largest market, Britain were the second largest um, player um, in the uh, market, so Germany was the biggest country and then uh, the UK were second. Um, now there's implications for both Europe and Britain going forward out of this. Obviously Europe are losing their second biggest um, country, so obviously that's going to um, affect the strength of their single market. They're going to lose a, a large proportion of their market um, space. Um, complications then for the UK obviously they're losing access to all the other countries and um, so they will no longer have um, tariff free or say tax free um, transfer of goods and services um, throughout the EU and um, this is key because if you have workers now um, based in, the, um, in England you can no longer transfer them throughout Europe to work and um, so for multinationals um, and foreign direct investment uh, the UK will no longer be seen as an ideal country to be setting up in um, they may look at countries like Ireland um, this close to um, the US and it can also be used as a stepping stone into Europe um, London, London as a financial sector and um, the major strength um, again for the financial sector in London is that it's a stepping stone into the um, EU for many companies um, so without um, Without being a member of the EU, it loses many of these benefits. Now, it still has its key competencies, but um, without being a member of the EU, it's not as it's not in the strongest position. Um, the immigration um, and visas are also uh, the tightening of borders is also going to affect the London financial sector, as they like, like to bring in lots of expertise from abroad. Um, often, they bring in Middle, Middle Eastern um, expertise as well. So. Um, in particular markets they will have the best knowledge so they bring them in to work in the area so without being able to bring them in easily it's going to affect them as well uh, many international companies have um, moved their um, their um, meetings out of the UK and as a, as, and it also has happened in America to an extent that they've had to move um, meetings and to uh, make it easier for people to get into the country so some countries now in the US especially um, are unable to travel into the US un unhindered so it, it makes more sense to have them in a, a country with easier um, immigration laws and um, so the long term effect and um, uncertainty and um, a key issue for Brexit will it actually take place so obviously there's um, a couple of U-turns that can be taken and um, it's the uncertainty of will it actually happen and trying to plan for the future is what's going to affect many um, countries. Foreign direct investment um, for the financial sector in the UK is worth 45% so trying to plan on whether you're going to give whether companies are going to give this same amount of money again and um, without knowing the outcome of Brexit yet fully and um, they're, they're going to be slow to kind of invest um, and continue to invest within the country and um, then um, establishment tariffs, what sort of a deal is going to be done with the EU, how easy your workers going to be able to transfer and goods be able to transfer throughout the um, EU from the UK and um, then individual um, businesses, how are they going to react to Brexit, are they going to um, stay where they are, are they going to move, um, like each business will probably be given um, the nature of their business is going to be different um, and obviously that means that their workers are going to be affected in a, in a different way as well. Um, the financial markets, um, will they stabilise um, and come back to the level that they were at or at what way will it go? So currency again, we, as we mentioned earlier, was a huge factor for um, international workers. Um, Northern Ireland and Scotland would both have, um, probably end up having 
um, boats and whether to de, de evolutionize so that they leave the um, UK and set up in themselves so that maybe that they would um, opt to join the EU themselves because um, the benefits that a lot of the grants that a lot of them, those um, areas would get um, would, be, would no longer be in place when they would leave the EU. Um, it could also destabilise um, the peace process in Northern Ireland. So this would obviously make um, Northern Ireland a, a more hostile place and would not be a place that international workers would wish to travel to. Um, so obviously then you would have um, reduced um, investment in that area. Um, so this is just their bibliography. Um, I'd just like to thank you very much um, for um, listening to our presentation. I'd just like to conclude by saying that we think that um, the economy is moving away from globalisation towards um, localisation um, and I just open the floor for questions.